So who's my guest this week? It's the former senior White House advisor, Fiona Hill. It was one of the most compelling appearances during the Trump impeachment hearings. Blunt, composed and incredibly distinctive with her strong Northern English accent. President Trump's top Russia expert was devastating in her assessment of policy and culture in Trump's White House. Her warning about Putin's danger to the West and how American ideals that were so appealing to her were under threat. Putin is always looking out to see if there is any hint that we will not follow through on promises that we have made because he will always follow through on a threat. Fiona Hill's journey from a poor English mining town to working for three presidents in Washington is documented in her book, There Is Nothing For You Here, where she takes her story of social mobility and opportunity and argues that class and racial barriers are still holding too many back. Here's a bit of what's coming up. And imagine if Trump had actually succeeded on January 6th and the members of the January 6th committee in the US Congress um, are pretty convinced that we were very close to him succeeding, had not Vice President Pence uh, basically refused to block the transfer of executive power. I mean, we'd be in a totally different place. I mean, Vladimir Putin would have probably just, you know, driven right into Ukraine himself. Fiona, thank you so much for coming to talk to us Thanks, so today. Thanks, Great um, to be with you. Really interested to hear what you have to say, especially because for a lot of people, they wouldn't have heard of you before that first impeachment inquiry in which you appeared. Uh, and I wonder for you, do you replay that moment? Do you think about it? And what, what do you think about? I actually don't. And I mean, maybe that sounds a little bit strange, but it was kind of, it's one of those things where you're so focused in the moment that when you come out again, it's almost like it didn't happen because it was such an intense period of concentration, a lot of effort leading up to it. And then, you know, the kind of aftermath was sort of moving on to the next thing, because so much happened as a consequence of that that I hadn't anticipated that I, I find it very kind of hard looking back to it. I find it fascinating in your book, you talk about this, being prepared for the room, that it was going to be quite cold, uh, and also how you looked as a woman. All these things had to be factored in when I, I'm sure you just wanted to give the information. Exactly. I mean, I didn't know I'd have to think about this. I mean, literally, one of the very first questions was, we're going to have to figure out what you're going to wear. I thought, what? And I said, well, does that happen to men? And they said, well, not so much. But the point is that as a woman, you know, people are already wondering who you are. And they literally um, said to me, you don't want to be a distraction from the truth. And the reason I wanted to put this in the book is that look, most times when men write a book, nobody asks them about how it is to be a man. Nobody even kind of thinks about what it is that they were wearing or, you know, in a particular setting. And, you know, they just go there and they, you know, they do their job. I mean, yes, if you're going to appear on television, everybody now these days with high definition TV has to have, you know, some makeup onto their head and, you know, kind of otherwise they look like they've died. <laughs> kind, of, kind of just the whole bright lights uh, effect. But for something as serious and consequential as a, as a testimony, I thought the whole fact that it was, there was a focus on how I would look as part of my presenting myself so that people would listen to my answers and just for telling the truth. I mean, that really hit me and thought about, you know, what a difference it really is to be a woman in these kinds of settings. And what did you do? How did you make sure you were listened to in terms of how you looked? And, and then how did you feel? Did you have to wear extra layers? Did you have to take the advice? I did. And I had a really good um, PR person, a woman that I've mentioned in the book called Molly Levinson, who you know, did this for a living and had been in you know, the broadcast media as well as a producer, and it, but who had worked with uh, people in these kinds of settings for a long period of time. And you know, she literally went through my wardrobe. She said, you know, you have to look a, a particular look, she said, that will be picked up by the Washington Post style section. Well, that look was when we were picked up by the Washington Post style section, which I was pretty incredulous about at the beginning. They said we were reassuringly dull. <laughs> so that was what she was looking for, because I was basically testifying with another person, David Holmes, from the um, US Embassy in Kiev. Did he look reassuring? Well, I thought he looked quite smart, actually. <laughs> but um, the, the whole view was, you know, reassuringly dull bureaucrat look. There was a Fiona Hill fan club uh, that sort of sprung up online, actually fr from, from across the spectrum in some ways, as people heard what you had to say and stayed. A lot of people talking about how focused you stayed on the facts. And some of those almost we, we'll get to through your expertise. But 
Did, did you feel it was a good use of your time or do you feel it was a waste of your time? Because ultimately it, it didn't work. I had John Bolton on, the former national security advisor to Trump very recently, and he didn't testify because he thought it would be a waste of time. It depends on what your perspective is about, you know, waste of time or good use of time. In the United States, there is still this concept of civics education where people fully understand how their government works. Um, and especially important in something like a representative democracy, a liberal democracy where, you know, you as the, the regular person wants to feel that your public servants, your members of Congress, your members of Parliament are actually taking your interests into consideration and, you know, listening to you and understanding that there are checks and balances on executive power, particularly on abuses of power, which this was, you know, clearly the case and, you know, this whole definition of crimes and misdemeanors and how does this process play out? It was an exercise in liberal democracy. It's the checks and the balance, the oversight of Congress. But ultimately it didn't work. Yeah, but it, it showed people that the system was there okay. and that everybody got to hear the truth. And I think a lot of people came away from that realizing that it was wrong for basically Donald Trump to ask Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, for a personal favor. Now, the political outcome of this, the partisan political outcome of this was, of course, that there was no censure even um, of uh, Trump. He didn't get any kind of penalty. Just it wasn't even a, a rap on the knuckles or the wrist, you know, from any perspective. And as Ambassador Bolton, John Bolton said, well, it could seem to be a waste of time if anybody was really expecting there to be some massive outcome for mm. Trump himself. I think it actually also emboldened him to go on to the next thing that he got impeached twice for. Were there any negative outcomes for, for you being out there and eff effectively going viral? Oh, there was a lot. I mean, there was all kinds of misogyny and sexism and threats and you know, threats of bodily harm and, you know, kind of all kinds of threats. How, how did they come to you? Mostly through the Internet. So I just stopped engaging. I mean, my sister, who was constantly monitoring Twitter and Facebook and things, would you know, give me warnings. And she would get in touch with the platforms to try to get people to take down some of the you know, most outrageous things. I'd get phone calls, letters, emails. But actually, I have to say that it was a smaller percentage than what was really an overwhelming, I would say, positive response in terms of just thank you for telling the truth. And again, everybody can tell the truth. So I didn't think it was that extraordinary. And, you know, again, there was a lot of other people who did testify, my colleagues, I mean, that people have got to know as well. And, you know, I really took away from that that there was a kind of a great thirst for people just standing up there and telling things well, like they are. Talking about what you know and your expertise, of course, it's Russia and it's, it's hugely in demand right now. And I wanted to talk about Ukraine from the perspective of, of all you have looked at and, and all you're looking at right now. Do you think the conflict, the war, was ine inevitable? I don't, actually. I mean, I think there's all kinds of junctures along the way in everything where, you know, things can take a different path. I think that what happened in terms of the decision making of Vladimir Putin is he thought, you know, there was a number of things going on. First of all, he thought the West had lost the plot, that we'd become very weak and distracted, that indeed we, all we're doing is engaging with partisan and fights with each other, identity politics, you know, you name it. But he saw over a long period of time an inability for the West to stand up to its own values and its own principles, particularly when it came to pressure on other countries. So Ukraine was in the crosshairs you know, going back to, in fact, the early 2000s and even back into the 1990s. And we didn't really do anything. Same when Georgia was invaded uh, back in 2008. Each time we'd find an excuse and not really take very strong measures. I also think that two years of COVID had an impact. You know, like the rest of us, he was kind of sitting down, you know, hunkered down, ex excluding you know people from coming close to him, not wanting to get sick. But he also became more and more isolated, we could see from the people who used to get access to him. So he starts to be basically shrunk down in his terms of advice to a smaller and smaller group of people. And clearly he convinced himself that he could get away with this and you, that there would be no backlash either in Ukraine or anywhere else in the West. But do you think, I mean, for instance, you've you mentioned a whole series of events leading up to this. But, for instance, there are some now saying that uh, the, the presidency of Trump and the attack on January the 6th on the Capitol was a moment, a particular moment. Did you buy into that? From Putin's point of view? Yes. Exactly. I mean, look, the United States looks like it was finished. And imagine 
if Trump had actually succeeded on January 6th and the members of the January 6th committee uh, in the US Congress um, are pretty convinced that we were very close to him succeeding, had not Vice President Pence uh, basically refused to block the transfer of executive power and uh, had agreed, in fact, to just go ahead, uh, pushed ahead rather than agreed to it. I mean, disagreed with you know, what Trump was asking him to do and had you know, basically um, certified the uh, electoral uh, votes. I mean, we'd be in a totally different place. I mean, Vladimir Putin would have probably just you know, driven right into Ukraine himself because he then would have seen the United States as completely finished from a leadership perspective because we would be no different from any other country in the world that had just had a coup. How concerned are you about nuclear conflict at this moment in time? Well, I'm very concerned about some one-sided action on the part of Putin. And I think it's very important for all of us to put that into a context and not be intimidated by it because that's exactly what he wants to do. Putin wants to take us all back to the 1980s mm. and the Euro missile crisis and war scares or back to the days of the Cuban missile crisis where everyone's thinking they've got to duck and cover again. Putin is kind of a free agent, maverick when it comes to this. He sort of, in a way, revived the Soviet era instruments of nuclear missiles and biological and chemical weapons. He's already used chemical weapons with Novichok and polonium, I mean, here in the United Kingdom, in assassination attempts, for example. During the Syrian war, after the Russians intervened, there was lots of chemical you know, weapons attacks, lots of threats of all kinds of things going. And just by rhetorically putting out there the prospect that he might nu use a nuclear weapon, talking about the chances that he might use a tactical battlefield nuclear weapon, he's trying to get us all scared so that we back off and then basically agree to surrender Ukraine or whatever else it is that he's but do demanding. You not, do you not believe it then? I, suppose I that's believe what... that he's thinking about doing it, but I think that what we need to do is to push back against that because we need to understand why he's doing it. He's doing it because he feels on the back foot right now. He hasn't been able to press forward with the aims in the way that he wanted them, politically and then militarily. And he's doing it because he figures we're going to get scared. So, so how do you yeah. do this with him? I mean, how, you, you talk as if, right, we need to understand him. You're giving some of the expertise that you've got, the, the intelligence as well that you will have heard about. But how do you negotiate with Putin? Well, what you have to do is get a full court press on him here. Because look, Putin wants this all to be about just his discussions with Biden or just his yeah. discussions with, you know, kind of the West. Because, again... Ukraine is one of the objects here, and the other object is rolling back NATO and getting rid of the United States in European affairs. But what he's doing has global consequences. And we need China, we need India, we need you know, other countries to push back. Japan and South Korea get it, and I mean, they've been very much supportive, but we need to get more than that. We need to be able to show the rest of the world that this has global consequences. And this isn't just an east-west spat, but it's just not possible to keep moving forward. Denying components to the Russian military for the war, not just giving you know, more weapons to Ukraine, problems of accessing the funding, you know, basically making, you know, heading, more, heading him off at every pass. But diplomatically, if he's hearing it from not just the NATO countries, not just the West, not just the sort of usual suspects, but quietly from others saying, look, you know, what you're doing here is having terrible consequences for us as well. Famine in Africa, you know, kind of really putting on edge security elsewhere in the world that's when we might have a chance of pushing this well, in a different direction. I mean, I suppose what you're talking about there is leadership and who's going to be doing that and if they're doing that. And you have worked for three presidents, but only known uh, by one as Russia bitch? Were you actually known as that? Apparently. I mean, I didn't know that in real time. I learned that later from an American journalist who was doing some sort of interviews um, for a piece afterwards. And this was how I you... I was not surprised. ...were I mean, referred to say. by Donald Trump? Well, by some of the people around him. I don't by know whether he, he himself him. ever said that. I don't think so. I think that gives a window, though, into the, the climate within which you were working, especially as an expert on Russia and as a woman. Yeah, very much so. I mean, it's just that kind of casual misogyny... You know, who does she think she is, that woman who works on Russia? I mean, it's kind of obvious. I mean, I, I wasn't the slightest bit surprised when I heard that. I mean, I was a bit surprised that I thought the particular person was, was a tribute to you. I hadn't even noticed who I was. <laughs> I thought, oh, well, I guess they did know who I was. I, I wonder, because of what you're saying here, were you actually listened to by Donald Trump? I don't think he listened to anybody, about, apart from, you know, people who he saw as peers. I mean, that's why, you know, we saw in weirdness in real time of him, you know, with Putin talking about Putin being strong and powerful and he was listening to Putin over his intelligence chiefs, for example, at the summit at Helsinki in that dreadful press conferences. We knew that he listened to people on Fox News 
uh, and on other, you know, media outlets. Uh, many of the people, you know, including Ambassador Bolton um, and others, would try to get on the Sunday shows because they knew that he would be watching. They were more likely to have him listen to them if they were on the TV screen than um, he would listen if he was in the Oval Office. And there's all that kind of bizarre, you know, creativity that had to go on to get his attention. Because if he went in and you sat down, you were just his staff. So he basically projected... But that sounds onto... like it's men and women, or would you yes, say it was worse for women? I think it was worse women. for women, but not all women. I mean, there were some women that he respected and listened to, like Kellyanne Conway and his daughter Ivanka Trump. But once a person started working for him, no matter what they'd been before, that status disappeared. I mean, he projected onto the government the same style, I presume, that he had in his private business when it was, you know, the Trump family enterprises, and that everyone was then the staff. So why would he listen to them? I mean, in that context, information and um, recommendations and direction trickled down from him, not up. You know, if you're an eponymous family firm, it's your brand, your firm, you just tell other people, you know, what to do. In the case of the US government, they're supposed to be much more, you know, advisors are supposed to be advisors. The National Security Advisor knows their stuff. They're supposed to be able to have a say in this. They're coordinating all the way across the government. And as far as Trump was concerned, we were all some version of staff. When he, you know, when, if you were called Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense, you were just a glorified secretary. If you were a woman, you were pretty likely to be a regular secretary. I mean, how did, did you take this in your stride? Did it get to you? I know you've been on the Women's March and then you accepted this job because you wanted to contribute, you know, and, and put something back and help. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't deluded in that sense. I mean, what I, I think really did get to me was just the dirty politics. Because, again, I'm not a partisan person. I'm politically engaged, politically active, but I'm not political. I've never been on a political campaign. And just this, you know, Game of Thrones, you know, kind of people stabbing each other in the back. I mean, yeah, it happens in every political system. But there's just the dirty corruption behind the scenes as well. I did really genuinely think that people would understand on the national security front that, you know, you needed to check all of that, that when it came to certain issues, really critical issues, where American lives were at stake or the whole stability of the globe, let's put it that way, that people would check themselves. But you and actually... I was shocked to find they didn't, and that's what got to me. Well, you also said that, you know, being groped in the 70s and 80s, working in a golf club, had been preparation, good preparation for yeah, working I mean, in the I, White I, House. Yeah, I would have preferred not to have that. And actually, let's no, just, no. just be very clear, nobody did that to me in the White House. But, you know, just no, when, you, the when point you've had being, that experience... As a yeah. context, is an yeah. extraordinary uh, extraordinary piece of help, almost, that you, you cite it when working in this Yeah, I mean, White that House. was kind of the weird thing of, you know, growing up as a, you know, a girl in, you know, 1970s, 1980s Britain, you know, kind of dominated by Benny Hill and, you know, raunchy postcards at the seaside and just all the things that kind of come with that. Nobody even thinks about it, just think it's very funny. Whereas you're a young girl, it's actually not very funny. But, you, you know, you just learn to have to laugh about it. Uh, this is so, you know, pre-Me Too that, you know, it seems like a, a, another world and yet we still get all of that misogyny and sexism. There was, you know, a, a, a dress code inside of the White House. Um, there was, you know, kind of very much, you know, Fox News, if anyone's seen the film Bombshell. I mean, I, I thought that was actually, it would have been good preparation for watching before I kind of went in there. <laughs> you know, and I was always aware that I had to, you know, change the way I dress somewhat just so I blend in so that nobody would, you know, pay too much attention. And one of the, you know, the funniest episodes uh, came when, you know, he thought I was a secretary and I was told by a senior colleague, you know, look, just don't worry about that. You know, he'll forget who you are. You know, you didn't imprint, but if you wear the same dress, he'll remember you. Just make sure that every time you go in, wear a different dress. So I had to actually get quite a wardrobe of different dresses. That's the theme it's we like, seem to be returning yeah, to. It's basically like, you know, some kind of camouflage, you know. It's like I'll wear my jungle camouflage today or my forest camouflage or my snow camouflage. It's just so that, you know, I could just get in there, try to do my job and get out again. And I'm presuming this was different to, to working under Obama. Yeah, I mean, nobody ever kind of went, but, you know, that was the sort of theme then when I get to the impeachment as well. Nobody there, you know, gave me a dress code. Actually, I looked back in some of the pictures there, I thought, what the heck was I wearing? But anyway, <laughs> so, I, I just, I found it actually quite funny because it's, it was almost like being in, you know, some endless school play where you've got the various costume. And I guess I was just trying to be a tree, you know, kind of when I got into the Oval Office, just so that nothing untoward would happen. I'm now imagining you in yeah, the Yeah, I know, exactly, the tree thing, you know, the kid in the tree. Hey, Mum, hey, Dad, I'm a tree. Well, but, I you should know, say the corner, in the, in the, in the Oval. In <laughs> yeah, the exactly. Oval of it. Potted not, plant, potted plant. I've not been in there myself. Yeah. But, I mean, there are no trees in the Oval. They're usually outside in the Rose Garden. Right. But okay. the whole point of all oh, that was, you know, get in there without any incident, but really focus on engaging with the other counterparts. I never got treated like that by the National Security team or the National Security Advisor. It was just this weird, you know, coterie around, uh, and it was weird, 
it was like being in Alice in Wonderland as well. I know so many analogies. I do feel that, you know, strange things in my childhood, like reading Alice in Wonderland, Alice Through the Looking Glass and other things, prepared me better than all of the years of fancy educations and degrees. Although it was very important to obviously know Russian and know your stuff. But for those moments, that wasn't and, the and best get, preparation. And it isn't a past some point from your point of view. This was the administration. You would have worked for any administration. Your point is you wanted to bring your expertise, but this was how you found this particular administration. Yeah. And you mentioned that education. It's a key part of what you've written about, your journey from the coal house, as you put it, to the White House. And worryingly, in your journey, which you... You know, there are there are lots of bits of luck as well. You know, the particular time you were born, the education that was then available... You really talk about the fact you don't think it's getting better. In fact, it's getting worse. That social mobility, uh, not just in the UK, you've looked at it through the prism of the US as well, is worse. It is. It's, it's, it's got much worse over time, exactly right. I mean, the kind of opportunities that I had, including in the UK, for basically having my education going to university paid for, I mean, those all have all shrunk. There's just a lot less funding up there. I mean, there's been an expansion of places, but a lot less funding for people. And just that threat of enormous debt is really too much for people, um, you know, thinking and contemplating that. In the United States, you know, what you think is the land of opportunity, anyone can make it. There's only a 5% chance now, very different from what it was in the late 1980s, to do what I've done in terms of going from the bottom 1% to the top 1% kind of thing. And everybody should have an opportunity, you know, to be able to move forward. Um, in life. It doesn't have to be an elite education, but, you know, to get the kind of job that they want, to get the qualifications that they need as well. And we need to really think about that. I mean, there's been a lot of movement forward on socioeconomic background, on race and on gender, uh, class to some degree here in the UK. I mean, in the United States, class gets subsumed by race in many contexts. But in terms of regional differentiation, that's not the case. I mean, I still see a huge divide in the United Kingdom between North and South. I've just been up North to see you know, my, my mother and family and friends. And it just seems like, you know, London is a total world apart. And it's the same, you know, for people in different boroughs in London. You know, the city couldn't be no more different from Tower Hamlets and things like this, for example. And in the United States, it's very similar as well. People from, you know, what we now call the Rust Belt, we used to be the old industrial heartland of the United States, feel that they might live as well live on another planet as have these affiliations and affinities with Washington, D.C. That's why January 6th happened. That's why people stormed the Capitol. You know, the, the, the Capitol, the White House is the people's house, you know, it's supposed to be the people's house, but the Capitol is supposed to be their symbol of representative democracy, and yet people saw it as a citadel, a kind of a, a forbidding fortress that wasn't representing them anymore. And just this kind of, you know, this upsurge and this insurgency. You know, I watched that and I thought, oh, my God, you know, look where we've got to here. That's the kind of epitome of these kinds of problems, when people feel that they're excluded in some way and that sense of representation is broken down. And you talk in some detail about some of the things you think need to change at the heart of it, education, but also what others can do when they do have positions of power and influence. I've got to ask, what does your mum make of your journey? Well, I think she's a bit bemused by it, but obviously she's pretty <laughs> pleased at the same time. But it's funny, like, she took it all in a stride. I mean, I, you know, I talk in the book about, you know, when I was out looking for that suit that I wore at the impeachment. My mum's just, you know, sees a sales rack and sees this suit and she's, Fiona, come over here. Look, there's a suit for sale. Do you need it for that impeachment thingy? You know, she didn't even, you know, kind of connect. fully connect about, you know, what it was. And she just thought it was a great thing that I, you know, went there and told the truth and, you know, did my job. She wasn't passing you know, the, the big historical implications of that. She just saw it, you know, my mum was a very practical person, a former midwife, you know, if a baby needed delivering in, you know, some difficult circumstances, off she would go and just do it without thinking about all the larger context. She'd just get on with it. Well, you seem to have uh, adopted a similar style. Thank you very much for talking to me and to all of us today. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Emma. Thank you. And thank you to you for being with us. Until we meet again, take care and goodbye. <laughs>